scripture comes from a long discourse that we find in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. After Jesus has fed 5,000 people, with lots of leftovers gathered up afterwards, after the people had tried prematurely to crown him as king, he began a long process in which he moved from talking about physical bread to himself as the bread of life. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Well, the Jews began disputing among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Very truly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. For those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood Abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, therefore all those who eat me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven. Not the bread which your ancestors ate and then died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This is the word. Any church that I've ever been part of stays vividly in my memory, not just in what was said and done, but what was smelled <laughs> and eaten. My first church in Garrett County, Kentucky, where fried chicken was served in one form or another every Sunday, and I was hosted at homes every weekend. From the church in Memphis that had the tradition of Moravian buns for the Christmas love feast. Once in North Carolina that dinners served that unique dish called chicken and pastries. The rest of the world calls chicken and dumplings. <laughs> with every place there were familiar faces and folks in the church with the gift of hospitality who provided that gift. Early on here at the gatherings, Along with the chicken spaghetti and green bean casseroles, I was drawn to the smell and the taste hmm, of, she, of, of Celia ski strolls. Celia tells me that these aren't pretty strolls, but Sister Schubert. <laughs> Somebody else will tell them there's something in the back. Pass these around and split them up. You know, there should be enough here that everybody can have a part of one, maybe a half of one or whatever. Why do you have fun when we come to church? Who says coffee hour has to be the time at the end? I invite you to kind of smell and taste as I'm talking here for a minute. Because I've maintained that this is the kind of thing that is at the center of our life together, our table fellowship as a church. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, you gave away your secret because I always gave her the credit. <laughs> <laughs> you have your available sounds, but it must be the way that they're buttered and seasoned when you when I was having the church dinner to be To a certain degree, the smell and the taste of this bread conjures up a memory of being around fellowship meal tables with folks here. And that's the heart and spirit of our life together in Christian fellowship. You can also maintain that to the degree that this has become kind of a norm and a custom and our life together as a church, that we are freely and joyfully kind of flying in the face of at least our current sensitivities around nutrition and what is overall in our best interest. Consider, for instance, the United States' overwhelming success in the Olympics and all of the post-Olympic celebration, and the fact that our First Lady, who's also a major proponent of fitness and healthy diet, happened to also be there, and also in the follow-up on the Jay Leno show the other evening when this interaction went on. When this 
this interaction went on. Hi, Hello. The joys of modern technology. Oh, you want me to take what's on it? No, I'll do it. Oh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Come here, Bonnie. Yes, please. Sorry. Well, to summarize, Gabby Douglas, who was the massive goal winner, we <laughs> trained her whole life. And how did you celebrate? What did you do? We didn't have time to celebrate. It was the uh, team finals and had to pay for our finals and event finals after that. But uh, after the competition, I splurged on uh, egg and muffin. Egg and muffin. Yeah, Gabby, we don't 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 even <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was a whole week egg muffin and a whole week bun and a whole week. Yes. yes.
a boy that was found nearby who had five barley loaves, which meant he was poor. And barley was the bread of the poor people. Five barley loaves and two fish. Now, across the ages, interpreters have liked to kind of take this story and say, here's a good example story of how what might have happened was people saw the generosity of this little boy, and, and because of that, they were inspired to take the bread and hide it in their tunics and share it. And so we kind of explain the miracle that way. Talk about a buzzkill. <laughs> Talk about uh, diffusing the story of its deeper meaning. When the whole point of the story is to Jesus' ultimate miraculous power to bring life and abundance. First of all, we don't know if the boy volunteered his bread and fish either. They just said, there's a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. For all they knew, they drug him, kicking, him, screaming with his lunch. <laughs> what we also know is this is the only one of the accounts in which it isn't the disciples who take the bread and fish and feed the crowd, but Jesus himself feeds the crowd. In John's Gospel, when something like this is going on, it's always a prelude so that a deeper point can be made. You feed people, see you as minstrels, in order to move on from there to talk about a different kind of bread, as he does when he talks about the bread of life. When he talks about how this kind of bread that we eat, or the kind of bread that came down from heaven that fed the ancestors in the wilderness, while it tastes good now, you're going to be hungry again tomorrow. But that in him was the very presence and power of God that lived in a way in which you never knew. Then, just as his point was becoming very erudite and powerful, he pushed it to a point that must have made them choke on their barley loaves, even as it might make me choke on my yeast roll here in a minute. He says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my own flesh. Now, John's being a bit diplomatic when he said the Jews disputed among themselves. We can imagine the tone of voice and how shocked they made sound when they said, how can he give us his flesh to eat? We can imagine the shock and horror as he moves on to say, truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, we're used to hearing this across 2,000 years of tradition around a communion table in which we can kind of diffuse it to a degree and say, well, we're used to talk about flesh, broken, bread, blood, cup. We can use the language of communion and Eucharist to kind of diffuse it to a degree. But if you're a first century Palestinian Jew hearing this, he clearly said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. If you just walked in today and never been to church before and you hear the preacher up here say, telling you what's right there in the Bible. Jesus saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You wonder what kind of outfit you've shown up with here. <laughs> I don't think Jesus meant for the shock of it to go away. I think he said it very intentionally to get their attention, to make his point, to say very stridently that what he was about is at a much deeper level than what their life their faith tradition, their experience up to this point could never grow. And appreciate how offensive this was to his audience. Now, we're kind of squeamish about it, but his audience was just deeply offended by it. They're, they're rooted in the, the law of the Hebrew Scriptures. They know Leviticus 17 like they know the back of their hand. And in Leviticus 17, it clearly says that you shall eat nothing with blood in it. That the blood is the source of life. And therefore to eat it is to, to offend God, the very source of life. And so you have within those kosher traditions very careful directions as to how meat is to be butchered, how the blood is to be removed, how certain parts are to be offered to the priest, certain parts back to the donor after being cooked and served, what's offered up to God, and the blood is carefully kept separated and placed on the altar. Not because it's unclean. You, you don't not eat blood because it's unclean. You don't, not eat, you don't eat blood because it's holy. And here Jesus is saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part. Now a later rabbinic tradition, a rabbi from around the 13th century, who was also a physician, had an even more articulate way of explaining it. 
identifying that in the blood of a creature or an animal is that animal's very spirit. And so in making the sacrifice, the blood is separated off and offered not only in atonement for the life that you've taken, but so that the spirit of that animal must enter you as you eat that particular meat. Native American traditions and other Eastern traditions would say, if you eat a lot of chicken, you get a chicken spirit. Because you get kind of hyper and jumping around. If you eat a lot of beef, you get a beef spirit. Being slow and ponderous. But there's some of that ancient kind of mentality at work for the listeners who first heard Jesus say this. When he stresses the point on to say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in me. And furthermore, if those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Now wait a minute. Here Jesus is again using a loaded word that we hear all through the Gospel of John. And when a word gets repeated again and again, you say, he's making a point here in the Greek meno, meaning to abide, to stay with, to be in the presence of. It goes all the way back to when the two disciples of John, who John pointed Jesus out to and said, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Two of them, one of them happens to be Andrew, Peter's brother, follows him, and when he turns around and asks them what they're looking for, they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. So they go to the place he's staying, Minno, abide, be with. When Jesus is preparing his disciples for being separated from him in earthly form, he says he's going to go prepare a place. He says, in my father's house are many moni, dwelling places. Same word in the Greek, same root word, abiding place. As he continues to talk to them in chapter 15, he says, like the vine abides in the branch, or the branch abides in the vine, it can't have life unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in them. Now, while it's gross and offensive and stands those folks on their head when he says it, Jesus is making a radical point here for them to hear and for us to overhear across the ages. And we're called to move beyond the traditions that we've known. We're called to move beyond bread at this level into an integrated life in which just as the spirit of the animal is taken into the person, metaphorically speaking, as we, rather than staying with the ancient traditions that said separate the blood from the sacrifice, unless you live in his presence to that fullness, take in his very spirit, abide in him, that fully and completely, you don't have life in its fullness. So what does it mean for us, particularly we who have the tradition of coming around this table every Sunday? It's easy to see that communion can be done in a way that is somewhat safe and contained. A little piece of bread. In fact, I'm often tempted you know, to break that big loaf when the folks come up and, and break from the loaf. I'm also, I, I often fight back the tendency of the works of institution to say, not only the difficulty, you just take the little pinch and stick it in the, in, in the cup, but to say, this is a symbol of life's abundance in Christ. Take a big piece. Instead of a safely separated segment, instead of a manageable dose of Jesus that we get by showing up in church, remembering the traditions of our faith, hearing the stories, following his way to the degree that it fits into our life overall, the invitation of Christ in the bold, symbolic language in which he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, is to say, we really are what we eat. We really do take on his spirit to the degree to which we are fully absorbed in his presence. Allow him to fully abide in us as he's constantly inviting us to do. Whether it's at the Lord's table, whether it's in the communion we find with him in life and death, whether it's in the daily journey, all of that is the, all of the same whole. And what we share together at the table is really meant to be the place where we celebrate what goes on in our life overall. When we receive and experience Christ not in safe, manageable doses, but eating flesh, drinking blood, fully taking him in. You know the figure speech often used when somebody's just deeply into something? I was that way with tennis at one time. Other folks are that way with bridge. Sometimes you're that way with gardening. Uh, think of the event of the activity. What do we say to describe it? He eats, sleeps, breathes. Whatever it is. 
Isn't that what Jesus is saying when he says, my flesh drink my blood? Eat, sleep, breathe, take into our whole being the reality of the Spirit of Christ in ways that are lived out, not just in coming around the table once a week, but in the life we live being the embodiment of his self-giving love, his commitment to justice, his openness to all, and letting our lives be a reflection of that in the life we live in the world each day. Now, you can never take it away from us, like any good church community you've ever been in, that we do some great eating together. And we're thankful for that, and it's in that that we find an essential element of what it is to be one in the body of Christ. But can it also be said of us, not just that we eat great meals when we come together, but that we are people whose life in the world is seen in ways that bear the light of Christ, that feed the world in its hunger, that offer the wholeness of life that Christ can be given. So as we come around the Lord's table this day, as we live our life of faith each day, May we become bread of life, daily bread, so that the world that God loves so much that he sent his son into it to bring abundant life and eternal life might be seen and known in us.